Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think all know me by now, but just in case you don't, I am Juliana Mosley Williams, Special Assistant to the President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Salus University, also known as Dr. J. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to our DEI Speaks event. Uh, for those who have been to one of the other two that we have had this year, you will know that this series seeks to explore and share with the university community, diverse topics, speakers, and events that will illuminate differences in cultural perspectives, sharpen understanding of interconnectedness, and provide educational enrichment of the highest quality. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are being recorded. Uh, this recording will be available and on our YouTube page, probably as early as tomorrow, um, on our YouTube channel, rather. Um, as early as tomorrow. So, um, if you know others who are not able to be with us today, um, spread the word because trust me, they don't want to miss this. It's going to be a great time today. Um, we will have a Q and a session towards the end of, um, our speakers presentation, but feel free, um, in the interim to use the chat. If it just helps you to capture what it is that you want to ask. Um, and then we will go through, um, some of your questions, comments, uh, towards the end. And um, also at that time, you'll be able to unmute yourself and speak um, with our guest um, on your own. I do want to acknowledge that yet again, Dr. Middleman is in the space, our president. Um, and Dr. Middleman, if you would have a few words, we would appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Nidia, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're very privileged and honored to have you. Uh, Juliana, again, thank you for doing all the organizing. Uh, this is a heavy lift. We know that. Uh, to everybody here, I would encourage you to listen, learn, and jump into the conversation. Um, the, you know, these conversations that we're having now, especially, I think, are so important uh, to what we do here at Salus uh, for our and what we do for ourselves, um, and what we can do here, and then pass on to our students. So um, I, I will jump off and listen and. Uh, Look forward to um, learning lots. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Middleman. I also want to acknowledge the DEI committee, uh, many of whom are in the space, um, and I do not do this work alone, so I appreciate um, their efforts um, and assistance um, and support. So, having said that, without further ado, we will I will formally introduce um, Nidia Han. Um, most of us know her, I'm sure. Um, as our 6 ABC consumer investigative reporter, troubleshooter, and co-anchor of Action News Sunday mornings. She is also the creator of the documentary series, This is America, which we will hear about today, a provocative fresh look um, at who we are as Americans. Just in case you didn't know, Nidia is an Emmy award-winning journalist committed to getting real results in our action, uh, for our Action News viewers. She is dedicated to exposing scams, protecting consumers, and encouraging businesses and agencies to do the right thing. In her work related to This is America, which we're going to hear about, Nydia hopes to inspire all of us to get to know each other's unique American stories, check our own biases, and act as positive agents of change um, in unity and in our communities. Nydia also covers general news. Um, as an action news anchor and has traveled frequently to cover national stories. Nidia is dedicated to helping our community in a myriad of ways. She is also the community advisor, uh, excuse me, she is also on the community advisory board for the Asian American Women's Coalition and volunteers her time for a number of other organizations. She is especially passionate about raising awareness and desperately um, needed funds for lung cancer research after the passing of her mom in uh, 2009. Nydia also enjoys mentoring uh, aspiring journalists. Nydia finally is a mom, proud mom of two young children. Um, her daughter is her twin, uh, <laughs> she's a wife, and um, she's also a friend. Um, and I can tell you personally, she has been a great friend to me over the last four years. Um, I had the pleasure of bringing Nydia to my past uh, institution. And from that point, we literally have garnered a wonderful friendship and sisterhood, having had the opportunity even to work with her on a piece uh, that she um, produced uh, herself for 
um, Instagram Live around allyship um, right at the time that we were experiencing an increase um, in Asian hate crime here in the Philadelphia area. Um, and she brought me in to, to work with her on that piece. So um, I love her as a friend and as a dear sister. Um, I am also very intrigued by her intelligence and as well as her investigative reporting. So without further ado, Ms. Nidia Hong. Thank you so much, Juliana. This is Mutual Adoration Society because I am a huge, huge fan of yours. Your work in diversity and in talking about cultural humility is just inspiring. And I learn from you every day. And I thank you for your partnership and your collaboration and most of all, your friendship. So thank you for having me today here at Salas University. It's such a pleasure to see everybody. And thank you to Dr. Middleman for also being here and for supporting um, the great work that the DEI committee does. I really owe all of you a debt of gratitude for taking the time to have this conversation today. Um, I, I really think that we are a community in crisis right now. Every week, we are covering stories about hate against a number of different groups. We have done stories about anti-Semitic graffiti um, painted and spray painted all over the Delaware Valley. Certainly, we have done so many stories about racism against our Black community, our Latino community, and of course, against our Asian community. Um, I'd like to start out today by focusing on anti-Asian hate because it's something that we've been talking about a lot um, and that has really ramped up during COVID. And so the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism reported that anti-Asian hate crimes increased 339% nationwide in 2021. The last number that I looked at in Philadelphia alone, those hate crimes increased 250%. And that's compared to 124% the year before. Stop AAPI Hate is a national coalition that tracks anti-Asian attacks. And that group recorded more than 10,000 hate incidents between March 2020 and September 2021. And these are just the cases that have been reported. We know from talking to people in the community that quite often these incidents go unreported. And that's because people are afraid. Um, sometimes there is a language barrier. Um, sometimes people are not in this country with the right papers. And so they're afraid to go to authorities. Um, sometimes they just don't know how to report or that they even should. And so there are so many barriers that we need to work on so that we can better record what's happening and then address the situation. And you know, when COVID first started spreading to the United States, um, I wrote a piece for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I started doing stories um, because I could see how Asian Americans were being scapegoated for the coronavirus. And then it seemed for a time that as everyone was amplifying these issues, that perhaps things were getting a little bit better and people were understanding that it's no one's fault. But unfortunately, just this year, I feel like a lot of these incidents have increased once again. I, my colleague, Safan Kim, works for the sister, our sister station in New York, and he just tweeted today the number of incidents in New York City. And probably many of you know, if you've been following the news nationwide, that you know on March 16th, less than two weeks from now, we're gonna mark one year since the Atlanta spa killings. Eight people were killed, six of them women of Asian descent. And this year on January 13th, Michelle Goh, who's a fellow California girl like me and younger than me at 40 years old, she was pushed to her death in front of an up oncoming subway train. On January 19th, Hao Win, who was 67, was heading to a grocery store when a man approached her and punched her in the face three times. And he said, quote, I don't like how Chinese people look. And he said, you shouldn't be in this country. Win, by the way, is Vietnamese American. On February 13th, just a couple weeks ago, Christina Yuna Lee, she was just 35, was found murdered in her Manhattan apartment. Police say she was followed into her apartment and stabbed 40 times. And this is after she made a conscious decision that night to take an Uber home because she was already afraid and she was afraid to take the subway after what happened to Michelle Goh. 
Unfortunately, though, you know, there is a lot more talk now and a lot more visibility about what's happening to the Asian American community, but the hate that we're experiencing today is nothing new and it goes back generations. And so we put together a story about the history of discrimination and bias against Asians in this country. And Juliana, if I can ask you to play that piece now, that would be great. This is a piece that we produced actually last March, shortly after the Atlanta spa killings, but it is certainly just as relevant today. No surprise. I want you to stay alive and wake up and come and see me again. But he never wake up again. Grief pours from the daughter of 84-year-old Vishar Ratanapakti, the immigrant from Thailand. A grandfather died in January after he was assaulted during his morning walk in San Francisco. Last week, 75-year-old Pak Ho died after a similar ambush in Oakland, California. Oh my God, he's probably so scared. Are you from coast to coast, Asian Americans are reporting unprovoked attack after attack, both verbal Asian pieces. Go back to whatever Asian country you belong in. And physical. Just last week, six women of Asian descent were killed near Atlanta during a shooting spree that targeted three spas. And Asian Americans across the country are reporting being spit on, slashed, slugged, even set on fire. What can we do to protect our people? What can we do to protect each other? The victims, often seniors, like this grandmother punched in New York. She fell to the ground, hit the back of her head, was knocked unconscious. Action News started covering incidents against local Asian Americans like Kyla Nguyen more than a year ago. He just hit me right in the face and he like knocked me pretty much unconscious. Since the start of the pandemic, nearly 3,800 hate incidents have been recorded nationwide, causing fear and anxiety. And now I'm afraid to go out and my kid is afraid to go out. The Department of Justice has now pledged to tackle the problem. So has President Joe Biden. It's wrong, it's un-American, and it must stop. But many say it will take time to repair the damage caused by the previous administration's anti-Asian rhetoric. The Wuhan virus it comes from China. Kung flu. It's been a sustained campaign for over a solid year now, and we're seeing the effects of it. But this hate did not suddenly erupt. To understand what is happening today, you have to understand our past. Racism against Asian Americans is not only alive and well, it has a long and painful history. Absolutely. One of the main reasons is that Asians are considered foreign. They're considered alien. I spoke out about this in a now viral Facebook video after a driver yelled at me, this is America. I am American, born and raised. Asian American studies professor Josephine Park says the forever foreigner stereotype is not only hurtful, it has led to racist U.S. laws. The first group of people excluded from entry to the U.S. were Asians. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first of many policies born out of the false perception that Asians pose a threat to our nation's economy, health, and safety. Many states made it illegal for Asians to own or lease land. At the turn of the 20th century, before COVID-19, some health officials blamed the Chinese for a different disease, the bubonic plague. And under Executive Order 9066, more than 120,000 mostly Americans of Japanese descent were imprisoned during World War II. They lost everything. They lost their businesses. Decades later, the U.S. government apologized, admitted to race prejudice and a failure of political leadership. But Asian Americans are still blamed for events overseas. Often this characterization of Asians as the enemy, and when you get that kind of enemy characterization, all kinds of violence suddenly becomes possible. This is the 150th anniversary of the largest recorded mass lynching of Chinese, which was in 1871, in October of 1871, 17 Chinese were lynched in Los Angeles Chinatown. More than 100 years later, Patrick Purdy shot and killed five Southeast Asian school children. It turned out that he was blaming Southeast Asians for taking jobs away from white people. In 1982, 
Vincent Chin, was bludgeoned to death. They accused him of being responsible for their unemployment, the unemployment of, of Detroit auto workers. Scapegoating Chin for Japanese cars in the American marketplace. You know, he's Chinese-American, but those distinctions didn't matter. And so it was very revealing how Asians could be lumped together. Two men pleaded guilty for Chin's murder, but served no jail time. This has been a pattern that, you know, if you committed violence against Chinese or Asians, that there would be no consequences. Experts attribute this in part to the model minority myth. That anti-Asian attacks get discounted and they won't be called out as racism in large part because there's this perception of Asians privileged social and economic position. The term emerged to describe Asian Americans as a group that's achieved success despite marginalization. It's used to make unfair comparisons, pitting Asian Americans against blacks and Latinos. It's really at the fault of white supremacy. It puts other communities of color against each other. The reality is Asian Americans have the widest income gap and some of the highest rates of poverty. But as more people shine light on these issues, many are optimistic the Asian American narrative can finally change. There's so many examples actually of cross-racial alliance right now around this crisis. So there are signs of hope. Joining me now are Congressman Andy Kim, Philadelphia Council Member Helen Gim, and Ishii with the Asian Arts Initiative. And we can end it now. Yeah. So thank you so much, Juliana. I appreciate it. Um, and, we, you know, we really are working to change the narrative. I feel like the community has really come together. Um, and even outside of the Asian American group, I mean, so many communities have rallied around us in support and in solidarity. And it is, I think, making a big difference. Um, I, I think one of the major things that has come out of this is that two states have now passed laws that require that Asian American history be taught in public schools. So Illinois was the first state to do that. New Jersey has now done that. Philadelphia passed a resolution to do that. Um, and so, and there are other proposals like this in other states around the country. And I, I think that is such a great thing. Um, the White House has also established a couple different task forces to really look at and address anti-Asian hate and bias in this country. Um, you know, and I'm seeing more and more Asian Americans in mainstream media being published and really getting our stories out there, which I think is just so important, um, just like we're doing here today. So again, I thank all of you for being here um, and for listening today. And I, I'd really like to talk to you too. I mean, it's a pretty small group. And so I look forward to opening up the conversation later so we can just chat about whatever is on your mind too. Um, a lot of people have asked me what they can do to help the Asian American community at this time. And one of the things that I think everyone can do is just to listen and to learn and, you know, follow Asian Americans on social media, people like me, um, other journalists, my friend Safant Kim, Dion Lim, Lisa Ling, there are lots of people who are really amplifying our stories. Um, and, you know, a lot of us try to also include history in our social media posts and things like that. So there are lots of sort of easy ways and access points to learn. Um, PBS produced a wonderful docu-series called Asian Americans. Um, and it is a deep dive into who we are. And interesting too, because when I talk about who we are, that can mean so many things. I mean, our diaspora is very vast and there's a lot of diversity within our community. And I think that's something that is often also forgotten. We're so often lumped together as one monolith and we're certainly not that. Um, you know, I should also mention, we talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act in that piece, and the PAGE Act actually preceded that. It is lesser known, um, but that is really the first piece of legislation in this country that banned entry by race, and it was Chinese women who were banned for being, quote, lewd and immoral. So you can see, I mean, that was in the 1800s, that the stereotypes that are existing today truly are nothing new. And we have got to take this opportunity when we have a voice and people are listening to really change our narrative. Um, you know, back in 2017, 
before the coronavirus pandemic, before this rise in anti-Asian hate, I was already banging the drum, asking people to see us as American as everyone else. And the genesis of that was this woman who yelled, this is America at me on a Philadelphia street. And that inspired this video that ended up going viral, that viral video and all of the responses to that then inspired me to create this docu-series called This is America. And so I really kind of want to do a deep dive into that, but Juliana, maybe if we could show episode one for some context, that might be helpful. Okay, coming up. <laughs> You're such a good tech person, Juliana. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> that is Don't not my point. <laughs> Don't speak too soon. Let's make sure this works. All right. Well, this led to an arrest. Injustice. This has created a oh, racially charged fire storm. New plans for white nationalist rallies Protests on college campuses. campuses. The first the Sunday shooting. of the football An season. unarmed black man shot and killed you officers. Can feel the tension getting greater and greater. I'm building a wall, okay? It is the fallout from his Oval Office slur about immigrants that still has Showing up in New Jersey aimed at two Americans of Chinese and Indian descent. Even 10 years ago, I didn't have some of the concerns and fears. Please give us justice! I didn't hear some of the ugliness that I hear today. A candidate for mayor labeled a terrorist on a lethal. This is America. I am American, born and raised. The video was my response to a driver who almost hit me as I was in a crosswalk on a green light in Center City, Philadelphia. The driver and I exchanged words about who had the right of way. Then she proceeded to drive off, but as she drove away, she yelled out her window, this is America. Those three words suggested to me that somehow the driver did not see me as an American. And after a lifetime of letting similar comments just roll off my back, go unaddressed and unquestioned, something in me snapped. Lady, I have been an American journalist for 20 plus years. I have seen Americans suffer and grieve. I have seen Americans rejoice and show resilience. So I know this is America. You do not have to tell me that. This is certainly white privilege with the whitest kind of rude and disconnected answer you could expect. Your video showed how all minorities feel with any experience like that. You see this face and you think this face belongs to an outsider or a foreigner. I need to show your video to my 13 year old Asian American daughter. I too am a woman of Asian descent, born and raised in America, but I've often been made to feel like a foreigner. I have two kids. They have this same face, especially my daughter. She's a carbon copy of me. Because he has the genes of his dad. He was called a terrorist. Why is my son not as American as your son or as your father? I don't ever want my daughter to hear that, to feel that, to go through that experience. I am Asian American and I am strong and I am proud. The Facebook video gave all Americans an opportunity to share their own diverse, painful experiences. He told me he was like, turn that spit music down. She turned around, looked at me and said, terrorists. I've been told absolutely to go back to Africa or you know, go back to your island. And it is my diversity, my color, my culture, and all of the things that come with it that have helped me contribute to my country. And so I'm taking ownership of those words you hurled out of your window to me on Friday. This is America. This was a real awakening for me. I mean, I never expected this to go viral. Hello from Toronto, Canada. So sorry to hear you experience this. To many of us, this is nothing new. Sometimes it's loud and ugly. Sometimes it's neatly packaged and polite. Stay woke. I teach at the most diverse high school in the country. I want to share your video with my students. But not everyone liked my message or my approach. We will always have a small percentage of the public who are ignorant. 
Ignore them so they may realize nobody cares about their hate. And some disagreed with my interpretation of the driver's comment. I don't take it as racist, but instead that she meant she's free to be an American, do as she pleases. What makes me happy about this is it did spark discussion and it did fuel debate and it gave people a place to go to have this really important conversation. So this is not really about my incident, my video. This is about these people who commented. Many engaged with each other directly. In 2000, 69% of Asian Americans were foreign born. So it actually makes more sense for the driver to assume that a random Asian on the street is not from America. Even a random Asian on the street deserves some degree of courtesy as a fellow human being. I highly doubt the driver would have felt the need to yell, this is America at a European tourist off the plane. I'm not saying this is right, but the only way it will ever stop is if people separate and stay in their own, stay with their own kind. But since I'm half black, half white, look Spanish, but have an Arabic name, which line should I get it? I was most interested in getting to know the people who expressed a point of view different from my own. So you felt that you as a white person are a true American and the only true American. That's how you felt. That's how I felt. Yes. Come on. My mission was to get people to step out of social media and really reveal themselves. A lot of us can get behind the Facebook and get behind, you know, other chat rooms and everything and kind of throw digs out there or give your two cents. But but if you, you feel you, the you, way you, you do, yeah, but see, when, when you talk about it, you really really make a difference i think when you talk to the person and when we did there were surprises some people thought you were racist on facebook yeah that couldn't right. be further from the truth exactly that was a mistake i made like put it explain it that way there are no rules except i just want you to keep it real I want you to be brutally honest. We asked students to share their thoughts on race. White people do have an advantage in this country. And their feelings on the impact of race and our history. Slavery happened so long ago. People still hate whites for things that have happened back then. And I don't think that's fair. And it's not your fault for what your ancestors did, but it's just like, it, I just don't think it should be forgotten. The conversation is not always easy. I think it all comes back. It all came back when you saw the video. I'm sorry, I feel like you just need a hug. <laughs> but it does bring those of us who were part of it just a little bit closer. This whole conversation, something like a once in a lifetime moment. I'm me, not what you think I am. To actually listen to each other and understand where we come from. This is America. 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 Esto es Estados Unidos. I really want to give a big shout out to those Benjamin Rush students who participated in our docu-series. They were so brave and opened themselves up and they showed a lot of vulnerability and a lot of flexibility as we were shooting and getting to know each other. And I just, I'm still inspired by them today. And, you know, I keep in touch with all of those folks who were part of that video, including the guy in the 76ers jacket. His name is Wayne Cheeseman. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask me about him and he was, one of my favorite people to get to know um, because there were so many surprises during our conversation. You know, um, Wayne and a lot of the other people we talked to, particularly those who expressed a different point of view from me, um, did not want to talk to me, as you might imagine, uh, on camera and in person. And so folks like Wayne, you know, I reached out to Wayne through Facebook, we emailed, we text messaged, 
And then when I asked him if he would meet with me in person and talk to me on camera for the docu-series, he ghosted me. Like I never heard from him again. But I think he and a lot of other people forgot my primary role for Action News, which is that of investigative reporter. So it's my job to find things that people don't want me to know. And so my producer and I found their addresses, their home addresses, and my photographer and I just went and showed up at their homes. <laughs> and, um, you know, in the case of Wayne and a few others, they answered the door and agreed to talk to me. And, you know, I think especially getting to know Wayne showed my own biases. And I, I had conjured up this image of him and I had this idea that he was probably some sort of monster. And certainly in my mind, he was unsophisticated and uneducated and um, not someone with whom I would have much in common. But you know, he answered the door with his two kids who are about the same ages as our kids. Um, you know, we both love basketball <laughs> and we both, you know, have these upside down schedules. We're working parents and we have the same dreams and hopes for our families and for our kids and for our communities. And I think when we were able to find that common ground, it opened up a space for us to talk about our differences. And one thing that I didn't know when I went to go talk to Wayne is that when I first reached out to him, he actually had not watched my Facebook video in its entirety. So he had responded on Facebook just in this kind of knee jerk reaction, um, figuring that he knew what my video was all about. And he said that when he actually watched the whole thing, he didn't like sort of the reflection of himself in the computer screen. And he then went on his own journey of learning and reflecting and he actually joined a fantasy football league in which he was the only member who was not a person of color and he said he just took that time to get to know those other men and he said he learned a lot and now he's actually um, a, a regular guest on his friend's uh, black radio program and so his life has changed a lot. I think his lens has changed a lot. And it's it, the whole This Is America journey was has been just such an interesting and fascinating one. And I think enlightening, not just for the other people who were part of it, but for me too. Juliana, you and I had talked a lot about This Is America when it first came out. That's how we first got to know each other. Um, and I know that one of the things we've talked about is how this kind of othering and this hate, I, I mean, unfortunately, really impacts us all. And it does seem that one of the things when people ask, what can I do, is I say, you know, don't just speak up for your own group. Don't just speak up for Asian Americans. But, you know, I try really hard to make sure that I show up for everyone, because I think if we're gonna ask people to help us, we've got to reach out and pull each other up with us. So um, that's another message that I often sort of try to put out into the world. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I, I think it's so important to really help people where it matters most. And so I also often tell people, especially during the pandemic, when, you know, Chinatown was a ghost town before businesses were even required to shut down. And that is just to think about where you spend your dollars and who you're uplifting. I mean, I really try, we have a partnership here at 6ABC with the African American Chamber of Commerce, where we are highlighting Black businesses. And, you know, when it comes time to do my shopping, not only do I think about um, shopping small and shopping local, I think about frequenting minority-owned businesses. Um, and I, there are just easy things I think that we can all do to try to move in and make a difference. Does anyone have any questions? I've been talking, talking, and showing things. So, <laughs> Yes, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I know we do have one comment in here from Karen. Um, Karen, did you want to go ahead and share, or did you just kind of want me to share your perspective for you? You can share. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, so that's why I put it there. But um, 
Sure, I'll I'll just share it really quick that I am um, of Polish Irish descent, and obviously my sister is as well, um, my biological sister. So, um, but she married a Filipino man, and they live in New York City. And when um, her son was born, she often had people come up to her and ask which adoption agency she used. Yeah, I think that is unfortunately a very common uh, experience. You know, uh, I am married to a man who is half Irish, half Greek, and so our kids are mixed. And I have been asked if I'm the nanny. <laughs> um, and so, you know, unfortunately, I think it's going to take a really long time for people to kind of open their minds and sort of think about possibility, right? When they see people and not make assumptions. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I have that experience myself. And so I certainly understand um, the experience of your of your sister. And, and he now he's now in middle school in New York City, and he's been taking the subway on his own to school. And she's terrified now of him just being alone without protection from her husband. Never in my life have I thought that I would be in this position, but, you know, in December, I bought a 10 pack of those alarms that you can carry where if you pull out the pin, it sounds a piercing shriek. And so if someone were to attack you, they would hopefully run away. Um, but I gave one to my father who's in his 80s and lives in Philadelphia and walks around by himself a lot. Um, I carry one and our children carry one. And then I also gave the rest to our friends and family members, um, other family members. And it is a very scary time. Um, a friend of mine who lives in New York and is a producer for NBC Network actually just wrote a piece um, that appears on their website talking about how, especially in New York, she is terrified. Um, and when people look at Christina Yuna Lee, you know, we see ourselves and um, it is very scary. Uh, Amara Walker, who's a Korean American anchor for CNN, just wrote a similar piece um, saying that, you know, she just cannot get over um, when she looks at people like Christina Yuna Lee, like she sees herself and it is really scary. I, I wrote a piece early on in the pandemic um, begging people to see my father and me for who we are and not to blame us for the coronavirus. But unfortunately, I mean, this has truly unleashed a lot of anger and a lot of, I think, sort of latent racism. Um, but again, my hope is that as we gather together, as we have conversations like this, as you hopefully walk away and then have, you know, share this conversation with others, um, that we can get to a better place. Radhika, you just typed in a question. Did you want to speak for yourself? I, I can. I just didn't want to interrupt. That's all. Um, you know, how, how do you have this conversation with your kids, you know, uh, when they are so terrified seeing these things either happen to somebody they know or you're just seeing it on TV, you know, the this. Um, how do you have this conversation? What do you tell them? How do they go back to school without being terrified of if they may be the next person that will get you back? So our children are seven and nine, and I will tell you, they don't watch the news. And um, I don't share with them everything that happens. Um, and I don't share with them every attack. You know, there have been so many times, like over Easter, we were celebrating um, our son's seventh birthday and my phone blew up and I knew why. And I looked at the text messages and I listened to the voicemails and it was yet another attack, this one in Chinatown. And, um, but when those things happen, I don't immediately share those things with our kids and sometimes not at all. What I do share with them is how important it is that they know who they are and they have confidence in who they are, but understand that unfortunately there is this hate and that if they are the target of it, I want them to come to me and be, feel comfortable to come to me and my husband um, and share that. And um, I will sit with them and talk with them and 
sort of feel their pain um, and, and let them know that it is okay to feel hurt and to be afraid. Um, but that, you know, as best we can, we're here <clears throat> to protect them and we're doing the work to try to make sure that, you know, they don't have to be afraid um, as they, you know, walk through the world. Um, but, you know, I think that the greatest thing that I can do for our kids who are so still so young is just to instill in them this deeply rooted confidence in who they are. Like my parents always taught me that to be American, I had to embrace the gifts and of our ancestors and really understand what it means to be Korean and American. Um, and I think for me, that really helped as a child. And so the truth is, um, you know, like I think a lot of Asian Americans, there were times when I wished that I was white. There were times when I really struggled um, as in the only Asian kid in our community, but I still always had a sense of pride in who I am. And this social justice work that I do now actually started before This Is America. So a friend of mine sent me an article that I wrote in college that I had forgotten that I had even written, where I was basically lambasting mainstream media for the ways that they were covering Asian Americans and Asian issues, um, because I felt like they were doing that in a way that was, you know, perpetuating stereotypes. Um, and so I really thank my parents for making sure that I understood both my Korean side and my American side. And that's, you know, what I'm trying to do with our kids too. They go to Korean school every Sunday for three hours. They don't always want to go. <laughs> They'd rather be, you know, playing with their friends or doing something like that. But I think that's really important. I don't, I hope that answered your question. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's, I don't want to take up more time, but it's just a very, interesting scenario when kids come back and you know talk to us i mean i have a little older kids 13 and 9 my 9 year olds is like the 2 year old in the family but my 13 year old understands what goes on and sometimes their perspective is you know if you're not black then you don't talk about diversity you know you don't count like indian you know of descent you don't count in minorities you don't count because you are a volunteer immigrant you know you were not brought here of any other necessity other than seeking another opportunity i was amazed that he understood so much about how it is like mom you don't talk you just be quiet you just you know let the because no matter what you say it's a perception of privilege you know mm -hmm. and it's like you don't know what we are going through so i don't know i always struggle with you know thinking about um <clears throat> how to explain this when I barely understand what's going on. Yeah. You know, one of the things I talk about a lot with my kids is the model minority myth, this idea that all Asian Americans are somehow well-educated and smart and rich. Um, and we have gone to community centers where that is not the case. We have volunteered at places and um, made sure that they understand that, again, there is such diversity within our community. And, you know, I've told them that within the Asian American, so Asian Americans as a group have the largest um, inequity gap when it comes to in income inequality. And so there are really rich, successful people, but there are also people in poverty who are really struggling. And the fact that there is this idea that we don't need help makes it really difficult for the people who are struggling to access resources. And so that's one thing that I tell them. The other thing that I really have taught our kids, because our kids are very um, aware of This Is America, and they've watched episode one and two and three, is to say that you, I believe that the time has come where we don't keep our heads down, we don't keep ignoring incidents, but we have to be loud and proud. And we have to make sure that we hold people's feet to the fire if they do or say something that is hurtful or not right or not fair. I mean, these are the words that I use with my kids, right? Um, and, and I've also helped them understand that when we do stand up and when we do speak out, 
action results, there are consequences to that. So one thing I did share with them is, you know, there was a Philadelphia labor union leader who posted a racist meme on social media. It was a picture of President Biden kind of looking like this Confucius man. And um, so I and a number of other Asian American journalists in the Philadelphia market pushed back on that and amplified that. And in the end, that board member took the social, took the meme down, took that post down. And then he also resigned and ended up being replaced by um, an Asian American actor who lives in Delaware. So the labor union, it's, it's SAG-AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild. Um, and so that's just one example. And, you know, I'm part of the Asian American Journalists Association and AAJA has amplified a number of incidents. You know, there was um, years ago, there was a restaurant in Philadelphia called Chink's Steaks. And an Asian American journalist wrote an article about that and the name ended up being changed. Um, more recently, there was a Philadelphia hoagie shop that had a menu item called um, COVID mac and cheese. It was macaroni and cheese covered in Chinese chili garlic sauce. Um, and after we amplified that, that menu item was taken down. And so I think that, you know, Examples like that are really helpful, and also in helping kids understand. And I've I've actually presented this is America this is America to a lot of schools, um, you know, for younger kids. And I think it's also helpful for them to understand that words matter, and you know these kinds of bias and like what we call casual racism, they really do snowball and then erupt into the kind of ugliness and the kind of violence that we're seeing today. Um, but in terms of our kids, I do think it's important to talk to them about the model minority myth and how, you know, that was created basically to oppress, further oppress our black and brown brothers and sisters by saying, you know, Asians are up here and they, you know, came to this country with nothing, why can't you also act like the model minority? Um, and I think that conversation is important too. But yeah, but I'm with you. It is hard. It is hard. Tali, you had some comments and a question. Uh, yes, I apologize. I won't put my video on. I'm walking my dog. But um, hi, Nidia. Thanks again for your presentation. Um, I. I'm of Indian descent. I was born here in America and um, so I'm first generation. And I think kind of, I know you mentioned it earlier about just the Asian Americans just being a very vast diaspora and, you know, everyone kind of gets lumped in together. Um, I do feel though that um, from my own personal experience, just those from the countries of uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh kind of get forgotten in some of these conversations. And um, so I guess my question to you, and I don't know if you've noticed this in your research, is how do we within the Asian community kind of help each other to get that exposure again or to, you know, lift each other up that way before we start asking everyone else's help for that? It is, you bring up such an important issue and it's such a good question. And it is one that um, I've talked about and I've thought about and I've discussed with some of my Asian American journalists and um, activist friends. And we really do, as the AAPI community, we really do also need to look inward and do a lot of work within ourselves. Because you're right, I think that, um, first of all, there is racism within our own group, right? Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that. And I think we have to work on that. And I also think that we have to make sure that when we have these kinds of conversations, that they are inclusive. Um, and so I know that there is a lot of work being done with some of the Southeast Asian journalist groups um, and Southeast Asian journalists to make sure that everyone feels like they're a part of the Asian American Journalists Association. Um, and, I, you know, it's the, I think a lot of it is kind of this grassroots effort and just the acknowledgement and the understanding that that is happening within our community. Um, 
and you know, other than that, I, I think you bring up a really good point in the sense that I probably need to do a little more. Like I'm thinking about the stories that I've done recently. Um, and I think most of them have involved people of East Asian descent. So um, I'm glad you bring it up because while it's something that I've thought of, I don't know that I've really sort of put in the work as much as I should be doing. And so that's something that I'll do too. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, it is kind of making it being part of the larger conversation. Because um, when people, you know, say, oh, you're Asian American, I said, yeah, <laughs> India's part of Asia. <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of that uh, common refrain. Um, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and I think, too, you know, if you or anyone you know wants to reach out and has story ideas or a something that you think should be amplified, I mean, please feel free to reach out because that is the best way, I think, you know, for me, that that's the work that I can do um, is to just make sure that your stories are visible and that people within your group are visible in a way that really resonates and is powerful and meaningful to our viewers. I mean, that's something too. I, more than ever, I'm realizing how much representation matters because a lot of the stories that um, we're covering about the Asian American community and this hate and these attacks are really because people like me make sure that our newsrooms know about them, um, you know, and I will keep going from producer to producer to producer to make sure that they're aware that this happened and are we covering it and is it in the shows and do we have a reporter on it or is it being covered um, just as a side story? Because I think all of those things are important too. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to our web department to say, hey, you need to put this story on the homepage. You need to make sure this story is on the 6ABC app because I think, you know, we have to mainstream the minority. And so, you know, I don't want to see our stories done just during the month of May when it's, you know, AAPI Heritage Month. I don't want our stories to just live on a page about race and culture. I want it to be on the consumer page if it's a consumer story. I want it to be on the home page if it's a story that we've done today. Um, so I think those kinds of things are really important too. Thank you so much. Um, are there other questions um, from the group or our audience? Beth, are you going to go ahead and speak for yourself? Sure, why not? <laughs> Thank you, Nydia, for your leadership and championship of these issues. I, I actually had two questions for you. The first regards sort of the very sobering statistics of uh, anti-Asian violence. You know, it has expanded, but I wonder, given sort of the circles that you're in and the work that you've done, do you see any bright spots or any improvements that would sort of help uh, help us feel just a little bit of um, positivity and all of that. And then the second question is, is for you personally, you know, this work is heavy work. It is very um, stressful. It is weathering uh, to, to all of us who, who have to continue to watch this happen. I wonder what you do for self-care. So, um, I don't do very much for self care. <laughs> I should probably do more. Um, I will tell you that I have cried a lot in the past few years. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's always right here <laughs> as it is in this moment because you're nice enough to, to even ask, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, I'm tired <laughs> and you know, it's, it, uh, it's very stressful because, um, you know, Oftentimes, if I suddenly realize that I have text, te you know, 10 text messages, I worry because I think that it's probably something bad that's happened within the Asian American community. And, you know, I have tried to some degree to detach 
Um, but I'm just not that person because I really I care deeply about all of us. And um, I care deeply about and not just the Asian American community. When I say community, I mean, I care about our whole community. I care about our world. And so it, it's it's hard for me to detach. One thing that I have done very recently is I have two phones now. <laughs> so I have a work phone and I have a personal phone. And um, that I have found has been really helpful. So at least you know, if I pick up my personal phone on my day off, then I'm not automatically seeing work emails and things like that. And um, I've even put all of my social media alerts on my work phone, so I don't see them on my personal phone. So I've tried to sort of separate and compartmentalize my life a little bit in that way. Um, and that has been a big help. Um, but, I, you know, it has been hard, especially for me. I have really worried, not just about my kids, because, you know, when my kids, my, our kids are so young that when they're walking around, they're with somebody else, they're with an adult, they're in a car. But, um, you know, my father lives in Center City and um, I, I really, really, really worried about him. And I've been really grateful to friends who've reached out and offered to take walks with him when I'm at work um, or to have a meal with him when I'm at work. And that has just been huge for me. Um, I do see a lot of bright spots, like the numbers are still so sobering, um, but you know, there are so many groups that have sprung up to advocate for the Asian American community, community to advocate for ourselves, to educate. Um, and I think they are doing a really great job. I mean, when I look at my social media feed, when I look up and see the stories that we're doing on the air, um, I realize and recognize that there is so much opportunity now and there's so much, there's a lot of easy access. Uh, to learn. And I think that's the mo most important thing. And I think we are making great strides in that area. Um, and, and not just, you know, learning about the news and facts about who we are, but also just changing the perception. I mean, when I look at um, Shang-Chi, you know, you see these really strong Asian American, or Asian role models. And I, th I think that's just so great. And that's just one example of so many. And I also think it's really important and great that within the media, we're seeing a lot of diversity. And so, you know, you're not just seeing, you're not seeing stereotypes and you're not seeing just one kind of Asian group. Um, you know, you are seeing groups that are poverty stricken. You are seeing groups that are struggling. Um, and I, I am really gratified to see all of those changes and all of those new, um, and, and new ways that we're showing up in America. Thank you so much, Nydia. I know that you have a hard stop at one o'clock, um, but I wanted to just go back to something that you, um, well, actually that was in the, the episode from Wayne, um, when he said, um, when you talk to the person, it makes a difference. And I often use the quote from Michelle Obama's book, it's hard to hate up close. And so in your final words, um, how would you encourage us to be able to have those talks with each other so that we really learn. You know, this is the final line of a TEDx talk that I did after This Is America, and that is, don't go to social media, go to work. And what I mean by that is it's really easy, I think, especially in the this world of Zooms and social distancing and everything, to not really reach out in person and talk. And I, there is no substitute for that. Um, and I just think it's important for people when things happen, instead of, you know, either clamming up or clapping back to actually just reach out and try to have a conversation. And I don't mean to, you know, burden the victim and, and put all the responsibility um, on us. But I think if that's something that we can do, I think that's the most helpful thing of all. Thank you so much, Nydia. We are honored that you, uh, have joined the Salus uh, University um, community on today. Um, thank you for all of your words of wisdom, the nuggets that you shared for your investigative reporting um, that was produced um, to really provoke thought, um, to provide insight, 
um, and to challenge us to look at ourselves, our biases, how we operate with each other, and what we could do um, to better um, unify um, our society. And so thank you again. Um, you'll have a little package coming your way, um, you know, a little solid swag uh, that, you know, you could maybe put on or let your kids wear or something. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming and um, bless you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who took the time to have this conversation and especially to ask questions and to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for putting together. And you can always count on us to be part of your support group. Thank you. Thank Take you care. so much. That means a lot. Thanks, Dr. Middleman. Take, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.